Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Morning, Rabbi. Welcome Rosh to Hashem. lesson number four of This Can Happen. Um, today, yes. we are going to have a really great time because we are going through all of Jewish history in an hour and a half um, with, a, with a spiritual lens, sort of looking at the entirety of Jewish history as not just a carousel or roller coaster of the same ups and downs being repeated, but really seeing the entirety of history as a process with a beginning, a middle, an end. And, and, and in that perspective, everything really assumes the state of forward motion and, and progression. And you start to understand why and how history had to unfold the way it did. There, there's a plan, there's a purpose, there's a meaning to it. It really does give us a tremendous foundation for understanding um, how we got to where we are, why, and where it's headed. So I'm very excited about this. I hope you'll enjoy. Uh, let me just start to share the screen. Give me one second. Okay. There we go. All right. Can everybody see that? This can happen. Lesson number four, we're getting there. Okay. Let's get going. Our, our operating premise from last week's class and earlier is that God created the world for a specific purpose, which we have been calling making a home for God in the lowest world. Um, we're about 6,000 years in, and the question is, has this actually happened? If you look at history, it doesn't seem like we're making that much progress, or whatever progress we make is quickly erased by the next little cycle. So... We'd like to understand how history actually works. So in a single word, let me ask you, how would you characterize the journey of Jewish history? Go ahead. Miraculous. Miraculous. Okay. Anybody else? Hard. I was going to say challenging as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mark Twain said that we're a tiny amount of people, but the evidence of us is everywhere. That's a great quote, this Mitch. This is true. Very true. Anybody else with any thoughts? Characterize the journey of Jewish history. We have miraculous and challenging. I don't know if there's anything else to say that probably sums it all up. Okay. Can you mute it? Back. Yeah. I'd say requires Rabbi. commitment because once it's really hard and you keep doing it, that is a huge commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very good. That's definitely true. Ileana, you want to Pers say something? Persistent. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Persistent. There we go. Definitely. Definitely. Um, okay, these are all great. These are all great. I think very true. Um, it would be fair. I think. I think everybody would agree. It would be fair, at least from a superficial level. You're all. You're all very deep thinkers. I must say. Um, it would be fair to say, from a more superficial level, that Jewish history seems to be a roller coaster. We have good times. We're doing well. Where we prosper. We're successful, we're safe, 
And then we have times where we don't do so well, we're persecuted, we're exiled, we're banished, we're suffering, we're oppressed, and the cycle continues up and down. Um, we would like to try to understand you know, this, this thesis that we've been building that over the years, by us doing mitzvahs and living the life described and, and ordained by the Torah, we're building a home for God, each mitzvah laying another metaphysical brick in the home, we'd like to be able to see the progress, not just see ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. Okay, and every time you knock us down, we get up again. Okay, where's the progress? Where's, where's the accomplishment, right? Are, are we building something? Are we just, you know, an exercise in being stubborn, you know? Another word for persistent is just stubborn. Maybe we're just stubborn, you know, and is that all there is to it? Um, so what we want to do today is, is explore how all the ups and downs are not just repetitive cycles, but are actually steps forward in the process towards the world of Mashiach, towards the world, the perfected world, where, the, where there is a home for Hashem, as we have been, you know, talking about and, and hoping for. So just as a small illustration, um, if you look at a, a typical house key, nothing, nothing, you know, no, no high tech, just old fashioned regular key in the grooves of the key go up and down. Uh, those ups and downs are actually specifically calibrated very carefully, right? To push the pins in the lock in a certain way and ultimately unlock the door. It's not a random, if you make a random up and down zigzag, your, your door will not, your lock will not unlock. And, and so it is with the ups and downs in our history, the ups and downs are not random, they're all carefully calibrated in order to unlock the destiny and purpose of creation. Um, so to do this journey, again, in an hour and a half, we have to be open-minded to be able to see things from a new perspective. So we're going to be questioning definitions that we may have taken for granted for a long time about how we have viewed certain events in our history. And so I'm going to ask you to join me in, in questioning and redefining uh, almost everything. So let's just for, for as a refresher, um, let's go back to de defining the purpose of creation. Um, because if we understand and, and keep sort of a, a sharp focus on the aim and the goal of history, it allows it will allow us to better understand the path that we're taking to get there. Okay, so text number one. Oh. Say that again, sorry. Oh, sorry. Trina said it's called a teleological perspective. Sorry, sorry about, I was talking to my husband. I didn't realize we weren't on mute. I apologize. <laughs> it's That's okay. what they call a teleological perspective, a perspective that is um, yeah. motivated, has, yeah, has the end in mind. It's about the goal. Very good, very good. That's how marriage should work too. Okay, so let's go text number one, page 139. Uh, Laurie, can you start us off today? Thank you. Okay, when the Holy One, blessed be he, created the universe, he, he desired to have a home in the lowest realm. Thank you very much. This is, we've heard this teaching before. This is from the Midrash and it describes in very, very uh, succinct, pithy words, what's the purpose of creation? God created the world in order to have a home in the lowest realm. Now, there's actually three, three elements here. We wanna break this down a little bit just to make sure we're getting the full picture. This is actually quite important for our entire journey today. So number one, what does it mean the lowest realm. What is the meaning of the term the lowest realm? We don't mean physically, spatially. It's not a question of, of how high or low you are um, geographically. Low means a low degree of awareness of God. There is not a lot of transparency that allows you to perceive God in the lowest realm, as opposed to what we call higher worlds, Higher worlds are higher layers of reality, meaning what makes them high? High is just a metaphor. It's high because that's the level 
where you have a greater awareness of God, baked in. Um, and so the lowest realm simply means uh, a reality which totally, or at least almost totally, conceals and hides an awareness of God. Um, we also have the terminology of home. What was the definition of a home? So we described it before, that a home is not just a place where you exist, because you can do that in your office, you can do that in a park, you can do that in the supermarket. A home is qualitatively different because that's where you can be fully self-expressed without any inhibition. You don't have to pretend, you don't have to perform. You, as you are, can be fully expressed in your home. And just to flesh this out a little bit more, we'll take a look at text number two. Uh, Ileana, would you mind? Pleasure. The emphasis on transforming this material world specifically into a home for God informs us that the ultimate goal is for godliness to be revealed here in the tangible reality of this world to the extent and naturalness that it is analogous to the way a person is found within his or her own home. When we take a stroll or pay a visit to a friend, we are forced to limit our self-expression to the degree that is appropriate for our present location. By contrast, when we are in our own homes, we can be ourselves openly and to the fullest extent. Similarly, the revelation of godliness must be overt and with full expression, for God desired a home in the lowest realm. Furthermore, Jewish law insists that we must not view a king while he is without clothing, for that would undermine respect for the monarchy. Despite that, when he is in his own home, there are specific instances in which the king will indeed be without clothing. Similarly, the ultimate purpose for God's desire to transform our material reality into a home specifically is that, as Rabbi Schnor Zalman of Liadi explains in Tanya, God longs to finally reveal and express himself without any garment. God conveyed this desire to us through a prophecy regarding the future redemption, at which point the goal of establishing a dwelling for God in the material reality will have been achieved. No longer will your teacher garb himself, which means that he will no longer conceal himself from you with a robe or garment. Thank you very much. Okay, so a home is where you're able, you're free to be exactly as you are without any constraints. So when we say that God wanted a, world, a home in this world, what he wants is the world should be conducive to godliness being completely and openly revealed without anything held back or hidden. Rabbi, um, yeah. Is that analogous to Adam and Chava in the garden before the sin and they were unclothed? We're getting there. We're getting there. Am I stealing the thunder? <laughs> no, no. But we're getting there. Um, and then the third element of this mission statement is that it has to be created by us. It's a very, very important point, that the plan for creation is not that it should be imposed. The meaning of, of, the, meaning of, of the purpose of creation is not going to be imposed by God upon reality. It has to be developed by the inhabitants of that reality, namely us. And if it doesn't happen, something very central, fundamental is lacking, that, that means that we haven't achieved the goal. You could have every other element. If this element is missing, you have nothing. Um, and that's sort of the, that's, it's not explicit in that Midrashic text we read in text one. It's sort of the implied meaning because when you talk about having a home in the lowest realm, the implication is that it's not imposed from above. It's sort of from within the lowest realm. Let's read text three to unpack that implication. Uh, Andrew, are you able to read? Page 142. Thank you, Rabbi. Go ahead. God's intention in having a home in the lowest realm is for the lowest realm to become a home for God on its own terms. 
For that reason, the home must be achieved through the efforts of human beings, the souls of Israel in corporeal bodies. For only then are the lowest realms themselves reformed into a home for God. By contrast, if the home would be imposed through a transformative revelation from above, the lowest realms themselves would not be, on their own terms, a home for God. Thank you very much. Um, going back to marriage, it's, re it's really the same thing as marriage. Um, you don't want to be with a partner who is compelled to be with you. You want that to be freely chosen. And if there's some kind of external force that's pushing the two of you together, that's not love, that's not marriage, that's not what anybody really wants. Um, and so it's the same thing between us and Hashem, the idea of having a home in the lower world um, and this relationship which, which, which involves us really has to be something that we choose and we, we not only contribute to, we create it, we make it happen. Um, to the degree that Hashem exerts influence on that process, it sort of compromises the, uh, the validity of what we're building. And we'll explore that point. This, this entire point we'll explore much more throughout the course, throughout the class, I mean. So again, just to summarize, you have it up here on the screen. The point of creation is that there should be a home for God in the lowest world, the lowest realm. Um, the lowest meaning a place where God lives. A home definition is that your true essence is revealed. And most of all, that it's created by us. When all three of these core principles converge, we can say that we have achieved the goal of creation, um, which means if a higher, more spiritual, more divinely aware realm of reality were to create a home for God, it wouldn't satisfy these criteria because it's not in the lowest realm. And if you would have uh, a situation where the lowest realm becomes aware of God, but not to the point of touching God's essence and allowing God's essence to be fully expressed, it still doesn't achieve the purpose. You might have some awareness, but not full awareness, right? So it's almost like when you go to your friend's house, you've known for 20 years, so you're comfortable there. It's still not your house. You know, if you have a guest, I once heard this from Rabbi Friedman, Rabbi Manus Friedman, he said, if you invite someone to your home, and you say to them, make yourself at home. And they do. They don't get invited back. You know, there are limits. If you're not in your own home, you might be comfortable. So it's the same thing. Like God might be comfortable in our lives, but not fully comfortable. It might not be a home for his essence. It's still not good enough. And it has to be of our own doing. It can't be imposed. So it's going to take a lot more time than we have, than anybody ever has, to examine all of history through this lens. But we're going to choose a few major moments in our history that sort of, they really do give us all the, I would say they, they really summarize the, the most popular, popular or common, probably a better word, um, phases experiences that we've ever had throughout our history. And, and by understanding the these four moments or periods of history through this perspective, I think we'll be able to understand pretty much all of history through this perspective. And uh, we'll be able to have a, a really a really great appreciation for where we are right now, which is what it's all about. So we're gonna focus on four major historical acts, lack of a better term. So act one is going to be the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Knowledge, the very beginning of creation. Act two will be Abraham's monotheistic revolution and the Egyptian slavery. Act three will be Exodus, Revelation at Mount Sinai and the Golden Calf. Act four will be the building of the Holy Temple in the desert and in Israel, and then the subsequent destruction and exile. As you can see, they're very broad, very, very broad phases and stages of history. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. As, as, uh, as they say, it's a very good place to start. Text number four. Um, Dr. Harris, 
Would one of you like to start with text number four, please? Can go ahead? God planted a garden in the eastern side of Eden, and he placed there the man who he had formed. God caused to sprout from the ground every tree that was pleasant to see and good to eat. Thank you very much. Okay, Trina, can you do number five, please? Page 148. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have come to my garden, the Song of Songs 5 1. The verse does not speak of a garden, Gan in Hebrew, but rather my garden, Gani, for the sake of implying Genuni, my marital home, the location that originally served as my primary residence. For was not God's primary presence originally located within the lowest realm? Okay, so this is basically what the world is like at the beginning of time. It's a place of tremendous physical and spiritual beauty. It's a perfect world. It's designed and inhabited by God. And these two very lucky, very lucky people. So it seems that we have mission accomplished. We can, we can give God a round of applause. You wanted a home on earth. Here you go. You got it. What's missing? What do you think? Was this, the, was this the fulfillment of the purpose of creation or not? Yes. You think so? Yes. Why? Why? He was present in the garden. Okay. So we got what he wanted. So it would seem. Mm -hmm. But then they um, sinned. And well, we get to that. Any arguments against the Garden of Eden being the perfect completion of the purpose of creation? Oh, well, I guess one argument against would be that they didn't create it themselves. He created yeah. the home in it. And so if the definition of the perfect world inhabited mm -hmm. by God, it would we would have had mm -hmm. to have yeah, that's a great point. Um, any other arguments against? I can't believe I have to encourage Jews to argue and debate. I'll do one. Go ahead, Andrew. It's a it's a more godly world, and it, we don't have that. It's not the lowest possible world you could have, so that you have to move into that lower realm. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's 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 fresh out of the oven. You know, still has that uh, the the baker's fingerprints on it. Um, it's not low enough. It's just not low enough. You know, we need we need a world that's less aware of God than than the world was at that time. Never mind the fact that whatever exists, whatever whatever reality is, like Trina said, has been completely driven by God. Humans haven't even had a chance to make a contribution. This is you know the Garden of Eden. The, the whole the whole by the way the the period of time chronologically of humans being in the Garden of Eden and everything being idyllic and perfect was about three hours. Because he was created on Friday towards the end of the day because everything else had been created on Friday before him, all the animals and so on. And the sin happened before Shabbos. So you're talking about, I think the Talmud says three hours of from creation until the sin. It doesn't take human beings long to mess up, does it? Oh, um, but we'll soon see that that might not be all that bad. So it's very safe to say that um, for those reasons, the Garden of Eden did not satisfy the criteria to declare this the triumphant moment of accomplishing the purpose of creation. Let me just, for fun, let me just throw out another question to you. If, if you all agree that this wasn't it, then the question becomes, well, why did God create the Garden of Eden in the first place? Knowing that this is not it, what's the point of having, you know, why don't we just go straight into a world of, of darkness and confusion and we'll all get to work? Like, give us the lowest realm and tell us what to do and we'll get to work. What's this all about? What do you think?
we're forgetful. So there's some documents that there's something better <laughs> to achieve. Yeah, yeah. We need we need a model. We need a model of an idea of what it might look like, what it's supposed to be like, some some kind of you know template to work with. So this is the template. Now that you've seen the model or or the drawing and the blueprints, now you gotta get to work building it. So stage one, this moment of time and creation clearly was not it, but it had its value because it showed us what could be. But as long as the model existed, we would never be able to move past it to actually get to work. You know. So you're um, in our yeah. turn the world into God and Aiden. Sorry, say that again. Are you saying that our mission is to turn the world into Ghana Aiden? Our mission is to turn the world into something better than Ghana Aiden. Okay. Ghana Aiden on the world's terms, because the original Ghana Aiden was imposed by Hashem on the world, and that's that's a, that's a flaw from the perspective of the purpose of creation. So our mission is to go to Gan Eden, but the Gan Eden that we create, not that Hashem creates. Which okay. that, that's that's the superiority of it. So as long as you have that model, it gets in the way of getting to work on the real thing. So what has to happen in order for progress to be made towards the real thing? The model has to be destroyed. Enter Adam and Eve's primordial sin, right? Um, their sin destroyed what was. It totally, right? It, they, it got them kicked out of the garden and the world sunk down a notch. And yes, it was a sin. Yes, they violated God's command. It was not the right thing to do, but it also had to happen. Um, take a look at text 6a. Um, let's hear. Howard, you have a book? Howard and Kim? Okay, Howard and Kim, one of you do 6a, please, and then the other one can do 6b. It's one after the other. God expelled Adam from the Garden of Eden. He sent Adam out to work the earth whence he had been taken. Thank you very much. That's a verse from Bereshit. And 6b, we have a commentary from the Rebbe on that verse. Go ahead, Kim. The deeper spiritual reason for Adam's eviction from the Garden of Eden is because God's ultimate goal for creation is that he should have, he should have a home in the lowest realm. This goal demands that God's home be fashioned, A, with the realm that is the absolute lowest, and B, using natural material materiality of the lowest realm itself. Adam was therefore dispatched from the Garden of Eden to work the earth, meaning to make the earth's physical dimension of space receptive to divine revelation. This way, even the lowest plane of reality that lacks the overt spirituality of the Garden of Eden will become a home for God, and the divine home will be fashioned from the reality of material existence. Okay. So basically, it, you, you kind of have to admit that from the perspective of getting to where we need to go, the sin and the expulsion from, from Gan Eden is actually a step forward. We cannot, we cannot accomplish the purpose of creation, which is making a home for God in this world on our own terms, as long as we're living in the Garden of Eden. If we had all grown up in the Garden of Eden, which is a world that's full and permeated with awareness of God, it's a perfect, perfect life. And you see the light all the time. You, you, you're handicapped. You're absolutely handicapped from doing something on your own. You'll never be able to do something on your own. You can't. It's not a question of effort. You live in an environment that totally feeds and nurtures and inspires you to do the right thing all the time. It's like what happens when the teacher leaves the room, right? You'll never know how the class really behaves if the teacher is always there and they're good at classroom management and discipline and all that. It's only once the teacher leaves the room that you can ever know, are these kids well-behaved on their own or do they just, you know, are they just 
you know, too respectful or afraid of the teacher to do anything. So you have to destroy the, <laughs> the, uh, the serenity of Garden of Eden in order to move forward towards the goal. Now we have the opportunity, okay, you've, you've taken away that world of, of light and bliss. Now we have the opportunity to seek God out on our own terms. And it's clear at this point, I hope, that the first up and down in history from the bliss and perfection of the Garden of Eden immediately post-creation to the sin of the tree of knowledge and being expelled from the Garden of Eden is actually not just, we had it so good and oi, it's so bad now. It's actually a step forward because as good as it was, it was actually a handicap vis-a-vis -vis accomplishing our goal. That makes sense? I hope so. If you have any questions, please feel free to chime in at any time with a question. So we destroyed what was to make room for what can be. And now to summarize, we have the three criteria. Let's see how the Garden of Eden checks out. Does the Garden of Eden meet the lowly realm criteria? No, it doesn't. It's too blissful. It's too inspired. It's too aware of God. It's not low enough. Is it a home for God's essence? No, it's not. It's just a place where the, the people were able to perceive God in some, in some measure. Um, and lastly, it's not even built by us. It's all imposed by God. So three strikes, you're out. The Garden of Eden does not meet the criteria, and therefore we have to keep moving. And again, if we have to keep moving, that means that we have to get rid of what we've got. If what we've got isn't it, um, and not only it's not it, but it actually stands in the way of us achieving the goal, we have to discard it. And so we are expelled from the Garden of Eden, but that's actually progress. Not, not it, it, I mean, it is a punishment, but it's also progress. On, 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 a, on, a, on a technical level, it's punishment. But on a cosmic level, uh, with, a, with a big bird's eye view of history, it's actually progress. Okay, so now we've got a world. Somebody say something? It was me. Oh, go ahead. I'm reading a book called The Garden of Amuna. And the okay. book is very good. It defines Amuna as having three stages. The first is that you believe that everything that happens is Hashkaka Pratis. Mm -hmm. The second is that everything God does is for our good. And the third mm -hmm. is that everything does has a purpose. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we apply that to what happens to Adam in the garden. Yeah, yeah. That it's not just random. That's right. It's it's going somewhere. Okay, so let's continue marching through history. Post sin, where the world is now in a situation where theoretically it's it's ready to get to work. We we're not living in the light, and so we're in a, we're we're in an environment that allows us to develop a relationship with God on our own terms, to develop an awareness of Hashem in the context of our physical lives. And we should be in, good, in, a, in a good spot to make it all happen. Um, simultaneously, because we are now in a lowly realm, um, we also have the possibility of messing up more than when we're living in the light. That's exactly what happens. Over the following generations, mankind became increasingly disconnected from God, lost more awareness of God, began worshiping idols, idolizing forces of nature, and, and God was completely out of the picture in society. Um, and at this point, we enter Avraham. 20 generations after the sin of Adam and Eve, Avraham is born. And now we're going to read a quote from Maimonides to describe, which describes my, um, Abraham's discovery of the creator and his efforts to share that with the world. Um, where are we? Uh, Andrew, would you mind doing seven? You sure will. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. After this mighty personage, Abraham, 
was weaned, he began to ponder deeply. Though he was a young child, he began to contemplate by day and by night. He had no teacher, nor was there anyone to inform him. Rather, he was mired in Ur Kazdim's population of foolish idolaters. His father, mother, and all the people around him worshipped idols. He would worship along with them, but his heart was busy analyzing everything, and he gained a clear understanding. Ultimately, he arrived at the true way and understood the path of righteousness through his accurate comprehension. He realized that there was one God, that he created everything, and that there is no other God among all that exists. Abraham was 40 years old when he, when he became fully aware of his creator. He then used his recognition and knowledge of the creator to formulate presentations for the population of ur Kasdim and to debate them, informing them that they were not following the true path. When he won them over with the strength of his arguments, the king desired to execute him. His life was spared through a miracle and he relocated to Sharon. He then began a pu public campaign loudly proclaiming to all humanity and informing them that in all the universe that there is but one God and that to him alone it is, is it appropriate to worship. He traveled to publicize his message everywhere, rallying people in city after city, kingdom after kingdom, until he arrived in the land of Canaan. At every location he proclaimed God's existence as it is stated Abraham proclaimed there is the name of the eternal the, Abraham proclaimed there in the name of the eternal God. When the people would rally to him questioning him regarding his statements, he would explain to each individual according to their understanding until he had brought that individual back to the true path. Eventually thousands and myriads rallied around Abraham they are the folk referred to in the Torah as the people of the house of Abraham, in whose hearts he firmly planted his great fundamental principle. Thank you very much. Get that man a glass of water. So after generations of confusion, Avram comes to restore awareness of the creator, peels back the layers, reveals that there is a creator to this world. There's a designer and an architect and the, the boss of all powers and stop worshiping these demigods or semigods or false gods uh, and worship the one true power, the creator of the universe. Um, and people responded and he developed a great following. And so maybe at this point we can say perhaps Avram's efforts being that they were um, the efforts of, of humankind, maybe that represents the fulfillment of the purpose of creation. Could we say any, arg any arguments pro or con that Abraham's moment represented the fulfillment of the purpose of creation? What do you think? It was a step in that direction. You say a step, but not it? No. Why not? What do you think is missing? There still exist many sinful people in the world. There's still many sinful people in the world. So we haven't spread it far and wide, you mean? It hasn't penetrated enough. Not enough. Not enough conversion. Not enough penetration. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Any arguments for or for or against? Andrew? But for Abraham himself, uh, I think he fulfilled his, his purpose of creation in, in heightening that awareness and making people aware that that was the, the true way that he, 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 in that way, he helped to elevate this lowly world mm -hmm. as much as one individual possibly uh, could. And in his case, that, that was a great deal. So, yeah. I mean, he is as great as he was. He's only one person, so 
you can't possibly speak with every single individual. So maybe, you know, in a in a micro sense. Um, one of the one of the missing pieces at Avram's phase is that you see this constant emphasis on God as creator, um, both in Maimonides' description here um, and in other Midrashic teachings, there's sort of an emphasis on the, the, the degree of, uh, uh, I guess you could say, maybe market readiness. The message that he was able to communicate was that the world has a creator, but that's not quite all that there is to God. There's much more to God than just being the creator. You know, when you have young kids, your 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 kids don't realize that their parents are actually people with feelings and histories and needs and dreams, right? Uh, to your kids, especially when they're younger. Hopefully, at some point they grow out of this. I mean, you guys tell me. I, I hope that at some point they start to realize that parents have a humanity. Um, but to young kids, parents are providers. They're just there to take care of you. Um, and they don't know that you have a whole other side of you that has nothing to do with being a parent. Like you were once young and you had fun. You mean you're cool? Um, and so seeing God as creator is kind of like that immature perspective on parents where all they do is give us what we need. All God is, is the creator of the universe and the sustainer of the universe and so on. But that's so, so lacking. Um, that really doesn't capture at all um, who God is, what God is, because being a creator is just one little aspect of what makes God, God. And so when we talk about having a home for God in this world and specifically God's essence, that, that takes into account much more than just being a home for God as creator. In other words, it's not enough that the universe, that, that society recognizes that this world has a creator. You know, it, it's nice that the, the kid realizes my parents have provided for me, but if that's all the relationship will ever become, and you'll never move on to sort of an adult eye-to-eye -eye relationship with your kids, that's going to be a disappointment. Right? You want your kids to be able to have a full relationship with you as an individual, not just as the provider. I'm not even talking about whether they're spoiled. They could be very grateful. But if they never realize that there's more to you than being the provider or their creator, then something's going to be missing. Something very important is going to be missing. And so all that Avram was able to achieve with the people at that time was to inspire them to an awareness of God as creator. But beyond that, for whatever reason, they did not succeed in, in, in sharing that and inspiring that awareness. And by the way, just to reiterate, I know I mentioned this earlier in the course, but we talk about changing the world, elevating the world, making the world a home for God. It, it's very easy to say world and think of planet Earth, you know, to just visualize the globe. But we have to realize that the world in all of these contexts is first and foremost ourselves. Who has the awareness of God? It's me. Who, who, or, or, or doesn't have the awareness of God is me. Um, making the world into a home for God is not everyone else but me or everything else outside of me. It's first and foremost me. I need to be hospitable to God. My life, my being has to develop and mature through my own hard work into something that is conducive and receptive and aware and open to God. I just want to reiterate that because I don't want that to ever get lost in all these discussions. We're, we're not talking about, you know, tweeting and, and telling everybody else what to do. This is all first and foremost about personal change in our own being, in our own selves. And so if this is not yet it, we have to move on. Something and, and something drastic has to happen because we're already on the way. We already have some awareness of God. And if this is not it, and we already know the rule, 
if you're not where you need to be, where you are has got to be destroyed in order to get to where you need to go. As long as you're holding on to where you are, you'll never get to where you need to be. So something's got to happen to weaken or even destroy this level of awareness in order to facilitate the next stage. So some, something serious has to happen. What's going to happen? Well, cue the next dramatic moment in Jewish history. After the period of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we go into Egypt and Egyptian slavery, which is not a fun time at all. All growth, you know, I don't have to tell you any of this. Every, every single one of you knows this very well. All growth is associated inevitably with pain. Um, as the old saying goes, no pain, no gain. Um, why does growth have to be painful? Why does there have to be uh, some sort of trauma, loss, difficulty in, in any kind of growth or change? Um, that the answer is simply because any kind of change means abandoning what was in order to make room for what will be. And sometimes there's this in-between stage where, where we've left what we had. We haven't yet arrived at where we're going. And we're in this sort of nothing in the middle stage. Um, and that's painful. Not having that sort of solid, predictable ground to stand on. Um, and things are in flux and what you're used to and what you're comfortable with is taken away is disconcerting to say the least. Demolishing what was is always painful, but it's necessary. Um, and you see this in every aspect of life, by the way. Um, a seed has to disintegrate in order to become a tree. Caterpillar has to seize being in order to become a butterfly. Um, even in the world of ideas, ideas have to be absolutely challenged um, and refuted in order for a higher truth to emerge. If, they're, if those ideas are not the ultimate truth, then as long as they're still you know, perceived as, as true, you'll never be able to grow further. And by the way, this is why, oh, well, part of the reason why, in Judaism, in Jewish learning, in our culture, questions are so valued and so encouraged and debate. Um, at least, okay, look, in, in these classes, we talk a lot about, you know, the, the pure ideas of Judaism. I'm not, I'm not a sociologist. And in practice, we always have room to improve. But these are our ideals. These are what we believe in. And, and we believe that questions are important and dissent is important. Because only through challenging ideas and even refuting ideas when they're not the ultimate truth can we ever hope to get to the real absolute truth. I'll add even more. Okay, This is between me and you. Atheism plays a role in this process. Okay, um, Someone who has doubts about their belief in God is not doing something wrong. They're doing something very healthy as long as they keep going. Right, Because what you're doubting is probably not the full truth of what God is. It's an earlier, less mature, less developed notion of God. And now that you've grown, and you've matured, and you've become more intelligent, you've become more sensitive, you start to say, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, that definition, that, con that conception of God worked for me, but I'm having trouble with it. That's a sign of progress, of growth. The problem is that sometimes people stop there and say, well, I guess I don't believe in God anymore. So, no, you just don't believe in the earlier version that you had. You're on your way to the deeper version. You're getting closer to the truth. It's a process. Keep going. Just keep going. You're, nothing's broken. Nothing's wrong. You, just, you get so scared by a, by a loss of faith or some doubts that we just you know, put the brakes on the whole process. Like, no, 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 it's good. Keep going. Keep going. This is what maturing looks like. It's a wonderful thing. Rabbi, so, yeah. I would add that all human change happens outside of our comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And so, in, in, in essence, in, inherent, inherent to change is 
that's going to be at least, at the very least, it'll be uncomfortable, if not outright painful. Um, and that's what we see throughout time. So you might have forgiven the Jews at the time of the Egyptian slavery for ditching the whole project due to the pain, forgetting about the whole legacy of Abraham, forgetting about the whole idea that we have a mission to spread the awareness of God. Pain and suffering can make you just drop the whole thing. Take a look at text number nine. This is again, back to Maimonides. Um, Mitch, can you read number nine for us, please? I thought we were on number eight. Uh, we're skipping number eight. We basically discussed it out, out, outside of the text. Number eight, number nine coming up. Let me turn yeah. the page. Number nine <clears throat> from the Rambam. Mm -hmm. The concept of monotheism introduced by Avraham proceeded and gathered strength among the descendants of Yaakov and those who rallied to them until there became a nation within the world that knew God. <clears throat> this lasted until the Jews extended stay in Egypt. There they regressed. They learned from the Egyptian ways of being and began worshiping idols as they did, with the exception of the tribe of Levi, who clung to the mitzvahs of the patriarchs and never served false gods. The fundamental principle that Abraham planted came awfully close to being uprooted, whereby the descendants of Yaakov would have returned entirely to the world's erroneous perception of God and adopted their crooked ways. Thank you. So if you're a realist during the Egyptian slavery, um, your natural conclusion is the Jewish story is done. Pharaoh is the mighty king of the superpower of the world. Slaves never are able to escape from Egypt. There is no hope. Nature has done its thing. The mighty has dominated the weak. And we lost. And it's not just that these are rules of nature. These are God's rules of nature. God created the world. He put all these natural laws into place. And we're stuck in a box. And game over, you lose. That's just how it is. You know? Um, and no wonder that when Moses comes to Egypt and says, hey, everybody, God's going to take you out of Egypt, they don't believe him. They don't, they're not buying it. They're saying, no, 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 don't, don't, don't bother with this stuff. We know that there's a creator, of course. Uh, the creator created the world. Yeah, we believe that. He created the natural world with natural laws and systems. And, and that's how life is. Life is bound by those rules. We are bound by nature. There's no, there's no escaping that. This is just how it is. And, and we're not doing well. We're not going to be doing well. And this creates the perfect environment for the big reveal. At this moment, we're about to see that the thing that we thought we knew is going to be demolished, and that makes way for the new reality, for another step forward in our enlightening, in our journey of enlightenment, getting closer and closer to the truth. Closer and closer to the truth. Okay, sorry. All right, let's read. Uh, let's take a look at uh, slide over here. One second. There we go. Okay. So, the phase of A does not, <clears throat> sorry, does meet the criteria of being uh, in the lowly realm, because Abraham began his work at a time where people were not uh, aware of God, and there was no um, great uh, connection. So it definitely qualifies as a lowly realm. Um, unfortunately, Abraham's efforts did not lead to an awareness 
to creating an environment that was hospitable to God's essence, because he only was able to share an awareness of God as creator. And at the same time, it was driven by the efforts of mankind. So two out of three, Abraham and the other patriarchs of their, at that time definitely made some progress, but something was still missing. And now because of the slavery and because of the experiences that the Jews had shaking their faith in creator of the world and God as the author of nature, they were now ready for the next step. Because in Egypt, the laws of nature failed the children of Israel, right? Um, they were not going to be doing well by those laws. And the God of nature seemed to them to be uh, inadequate for what they needed. And that's a good thing because the truth of God, like I mentioned before, is much more than just creator of the world. God created all those rules and he can break those rules too. And that truth was displayed with the exodus from Egypt and the giving the Torah at Mount Sinai. So the 10 plagues broke every law of nature whatsoever. Um, the 10 plagues were all about not defining, um, not being defined by the rules of nature, um, splitting of the sea, water flows. It's not supposed to stand upright until it does. And the revelation at Mount Sinai where God gave us the Torah is the biggest demonstration of God being beyond nature. Over 2 million people gathered and heard God say, I am the Lord your God. Um, it was such a powerful experience that it shook their souls loose from their bodies. They had to be revived. Um, it was a phenomenon that the, the, the senses that they, their, their physical senses transcended their normal limitations. And the Torah says that they heard the sounds, they heard the sights and they saw the sounds. Um, and that string of experiences demonstrated the truth that God is not only the creator of the universe, he's beyond the universe. There's much more to God than being the creator. He's not bound by the laws of nature. And as such, the laws of nature should never be considered to be the be all and end all. Um, and this is alluded to actually in the first commandment. Take a look at text 10a. Um, Laurie, can you do, uh, why don't you do 10a and b, please? <clears throat> I am your God who extracted you from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. The biblical uh, commentators wonder why Hashem emphasized, I am your God who extracted you from the land of Egypt, instead of, I am your God who created heavens and earth. Surely the latter demonstrates a far greater feat. The explanation is that the Exodus demonstrates something far more wondrous than creation. The Exodus demonstrates that after creating heaven and earth with a defined set of rules of nature, Hashem is nevertheless <clears throat> able to alter the natural order and to conduct the universe in an entirely supernatural manner. Thank you very much. And that's a massive point. We keep this in mind all the time, that no matter what's going on around us, and, and the Jewish experience ever since then has been very solid proof of this. The laws of nature are, are, are not to be taken all that seriously. I mean, don't jump off a 20-story building and say, God's going to save me. But like Mark Twain said, by all natural laws, the Jew should have ceased to exist a long time ago. And uh, we, we take the laws of nature with a grain of salt. So maybe now, maybe at this point, we finally reached the stage where we can say the purpose of this has been achieved. We have a home for God, awareness of God's essence, not just God as creator, but God as God beyond, beyond nature. Um, we have that awareness in the lowest realm. Maybe we've arrived. Could this be or could this not be, in your opinion, um, a moment in time where the purpose of creation was achieved? What do you think?
Rabbi, yeah, is there? I mean, my understanding is is that you know God taking the Jewish people out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, is is really the essence of what created the Jewish people. That is the defining mm -hmm. moment. It's why we refer to it in all the liturgy. It's it is right. it is what made us a people. But right. but God didn't just create the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So is there significance to the fact that it, it may have fulfilled some of, of the criteria, but maybe not all, because it, it, it's an event that happened for the Jewish people? Right. That's a great point. That's a great point. I, There's only, I, you know, the minority of, of the global population is touched by all this, even if everybody else hears about it, but they're not really having the same kind of experience. Um, perhaps in order to really achieve the purpose of creation, everybody has to have, everybody has to be along for the ride. Yeah, that's a great point. Mitch, you want to say something? Well, uh, Howard, I would wonder, would you agree if the Exodus and the subsequent giving of the Torah mark the birth of Israel as a nation? I think that's what you were saying. Was that what you were saying, Howard? Yeah. 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 And, and his point was that that's, that, that's actually a handicap because it's only the Jewish people and we left the rest of humanity out of the picture, supposedly. And that can be the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose has to affect the entire world, all of humanity. I think it's a very good question. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I don't know if we'll get to it in this class, but definitely through the, throughout the course of the course, we're going to touch on all of humanity and how all of humanity fits in. Keep that in mind. It's a very important point. I would add um, um, yeah. the three criteria. I think it still doesn't truly portray the essence of God. I, th I still think there's more to the essence of Hashem. And okay. for example, as our father, uh, you know, there's still more elements of, of the essence of, of sure. Hashem. But also at that time, it wasn't created by us because they were told and they were taken. It wasn't their choice. That's right. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would say that. Exactly. The biggest problem with all of this is that the Jews didn't do a thing. The people are completely passive throughout this entire operation. I mean, they even complain when they can. But they're not contributing. They're not making things happen. So it's a big flaw. We're just going along for the ride. So we have two out of three, you know, maybe. Kim wants to quibble about God's essence. We can leave that as a half. Um, we, have, we have the lowest realm. That part we have, you know, uh, the, moment of, the moment of Exodus and the moment of the plagues begin. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a very dark place. So it's, it's sufficiently dark and low being a slave in Egypt. You know, that, that's pretty dark and low, but we didn't make it happen. And that's the biggest problem here. Um, and so transformation, again, just to reiterate the point, transformation cannot happen from the, from the outside. It has to be grassroots. It has to be bottom up. The teacher, the parent has to be quiet. You have to be quiet. You, you, can't, mess, you can't mess it up by saying something. You got to get out of the way. And here, Hashem does the exact opposite of getting out of the way. He is very present in the entire process. So we call that actually an imposition, not a transformation. God imposes himself on reality. I mean, we're very grateful that he did. This is a good thing. But it just doesn't meet the criteria to say that we've achieved the purpose of creation. Because we did not cause that transformation. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, at the very early, the, the earliest generation of Chabad, right when the Chabad movement was born, late 1700s. So there were, you know, there were, the, the Hasidic movement was maybe, maybe, maybe um, let me think for a second. Sixty, seventy years old, 
you had a number of Hasidic communities that had sprung up. You had Rebbe's and their students in various communities throughout white Russia and Poland, Lithuania a little bit. Um, Chabad had a very unique approach. And Chabad's approach from the beginning had always, has always emphasized the importance of the work that you put in, in your spiritual work, in your spiritual service to God, in your personal growth and transformation. It's got to be you. So there was a fellow who was a follower of Chabad, a follower of the first Rebbe of Chabad, Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi. And he once witnessed another chassid of another Rebbe, of a different Hasidic group, praying in shul. And he watched this fellow pray, and the, 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 the fire, the emotion, the inspiration that this guy had during his prayers was very admirable. And this Chabad guy was very jealous. Like, look at this guy. He, he really dominates. He really prays. And me, I'm like scratching by. So he goes to visit the Rebbe, the Chabad Rebbe, Rebbe Shnerzal. And he says, I don't understand this other chassid of his, that other chassid's Rebbe was Rabbi Chaim Haikel of the city of Amdur. He said, that Amdur chassid, Every day he's praying with fire, it's, he's rocking and rolling. And I try my best, but I'm not always successful. I don't always have a great inspired prayer service. So the Rebbe put his head down thinking for a few minutes. He lifted his head up and he said, when that chassid prays, his Rebbe is burning in him. What I want is that you yourself should burn. You should have the fire, not just take fire from your teacher, not just be inspired by your teacher. You should be the source of inspiration, self-generated on your own terms. That's what it's all about. And by the way, have any of you ever heard of uh, a pilgrimage or any kind of memorial or, or any kind of Jewish... Uh, I don't know, worship at Mount Sinai. I haven't. Every now and then you hear of some Indiana Jones that goes off into the desert, claims he found the site and, and, and makes something out of it, but it's never historically been a big deal. Historically, it has never been a big deal. We came to this mountain in the desert. We had the greatest experience ever. And there's no, no mention of it, no memory of it. No, we don't... Nothing. It's like it didn't happen. In, in, in terms of our relationship, the Jewish people's relationship with that site is non-existent. It is. It, it, it's a little bit odd until you understand that it can't be a holy place because it was all imposed from, up, from above. It was God descending on Mount Sinai, giving us the Torah. It was all top-down. And if it's all top-down... All right. It was nice. It was nice. But, you know, that's not where the relationship happens. Take a look at text number. Uh, Ileana, would you mind? Text number. 11. The divine revelation at the giving of the Torah occurred in a top-down manner. Our lower reality was unprepared to receive this revelation of divine light, and consequently, it was unable to internalize to a noticeable degree the light that it did receive. For that reason, the revelation of divine light at the giving of the Torah was temporary. It ended abruptly, as described in the verse, when an extended blast is sounded with the ram's horn, they may ascend the mountain for the divinity dissipated entirely, leaving the mountain unchanged. Thank you. And this is true for all of us all the time. Real change happens from within. Change can't be imposed. And if it is imposed, it won't last. You can try. It'll have the same thing will happen every time. If you use, you know, carrot and stick, whatever, it, it doesn't get the, the ultimate 
prize of, of permanent real change from within the person. And what Hashem wants is not just people conforming and obeying out of a desire for reward or fear of punishment and so on. He wants us to buy in on our own terms. And so Mount Sinai had to happen. He has to give us the Torah. He has to show up and, and do it himself and so on. But that can't be, will never be the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose will never be realized in that environment. And so once again, if it's not good enough, it has to be destroyed. This phase, this moment in time, being that it was not, it could not be the ultimate goal because there was too much top down, not enough of the grassroots, not enough of the people, it has to be destroyed. How did we destroy? How did we move on and not get stuck in that phase of time, that moment in history? Enter the golden calf. On the surface, the golden calf is, 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 is mind-boggling. It's a disaster. It's, it's the highest level of infidelity, the worst infidelity you could ever have. Like you just saw God. You just had a face-to-face -face with God. How, how do you turn around and, and worship a calf made out of gold? And that's true. It is a terrible sin. But again, from the bird's eye view of, of you know, cosmic history, this is the only way you can tear down and move past the dramatic, inspiring, but top-down revelation of Mount Sinai and move on really. Now we're going to shift really into a higher gear of us doing the work. Because the Jewish people had been handed a home for God on a silver platter. But the only way, and, and then they threw it away. And now that they've thrown it away, the only way back is if you get there on your own. The only way back is you've rebuilt that connection, rebuild that awareness on your own. You're the one who's going to make it happen. Hashem's not coming down the mountain again. That's over. And you threw that away. You violated that. You want to bring it back? You do it. Look at text number 12. Um, Howard or Kim, can we get one of you for 12, please? The sin of the golden calf transpired due to a preceding supernatural decision that, through such an event, the people will achieve the superiority of teshuva. Thank you. There's something about teshuva, repentance, coming back to God after you've messed up that is way, way deeper and more valuable than the perfection that he gave you on his terms. And that's what we're aiming for over here. So let's look at what's going on. When, when we go to the Exodus from Sinai, we've got the lowly realm, definitely. Um, we also have a demonstration of God's essence being beyond nature and all that. We don't have the element of being built by us. That's what's missing here. And now that we've, you know, eradicated and, and, and violated the vibe, the moment, the awareness that we got from the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, now the stage is set for us to be able to contribute our own two cents, to do it on our own terms. That's what we've been waiting for. So after the golden calf, what happens? They, the God, God gives them the commandment to build a temple. They start the fundraising campaign, the first capital campaign in Jewish history. Wildly, wildly successful. They had a surplus. And they build a mishkan. They build, they build the, the, the uh, portable temple in the wilderness. And that goes with them throughout their time in the desert. So when they move into Israel, after a few hundred years, they're able to build a permanent Beit HaMikdash, a permanent temple in Jerusalem. This is a physical you know, construction that reflects beyond the physical construction. It reflects that the world is now becoming a home for God, created by the people, 
And seemingly we're, we're really getting pretty close, pretty close to the goal. You know, we've been through a few phases of history and each was necessary. Each carried us one step further. And now it seems like everything's starting to come together. But is it? Um, <clears throat> but is it? Go ahead. But is it because the, uh, the building of the Mishkan, God or Hashem still gave us all the directions? <clears throat> it wasn't something that we did on our own still. So we still have Very good. Very good. You're, you're thinking you're thinking like a Chabadnik. That's that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It is it is a major flaw. Hang on one second. Let's look at text 13. I'm gonna to get to your question in a moment. Um, Andrew, can you read number 13? Thank you, Rabbi. The divine presence was manifested within the tabernacle as a result of the Jewish people's tangible efforts in accordance with their mandate, they should make a sanctuary for me. And because the divine presence's manifestation occurred through human action, the sanctity became installed within the materiality of the tabernacle's components. Consequently, the physical tabernacle and its components gained a lasting sanctity. Okay, thank you. And again, this seems to be it. Like maybe this is the moment we've been waiting for. We've got the lowly realm. We've got the self self driven initiative. It's not coming from God. It's we're the ones making it happen. We're the ones who built it. We're the ones who contributed the money and everything. And it's a home for God's essence. Let's 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 call it a day. We've re we've reached the top. Rabbi. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, going back to the home being the place where where we feel most at home, that that is the essence of our home. And that's why we don't, even though when we go to someone else's home, we're told to make yourself at home, but we can't because it's not our home. So is there something inherently wrong that if we're creating a, a home for God, that God gave us the instructions and said, this is what would make me feel at home? Great question. Okay, so we have we have a very nice debate. Finally, finally, a nice debate here. Lori says the Beit Hamikdash doesn't cut the mustard because God gives the instructions. So we're not driven by our own self initiative. We're just obeying instructions, and it's lacking that quality of you know the grassroots. Howard says, one second. How else are you going to make it suitable for God's essence if you don't listen to what He wants? Right? What's why is that a flaw? It, you know, I don't want to give you a birthday present based on what I think you should have as a birthday present, right? I, I think my wife should have a new lawnmower for her birthday, along with a 24 pack of beer that she can share with her friends while she'll judge the lawn. If I try that on one birthday, um, I better I better be good friends with the owner of a local hotel. Right? I have to give a gift on her terms. Not on my terms. By the way, that's not my idea of a gift anyway, either. So don't, don't get any ideas. So Howard, your point is very well taken. Hashem is giving instructions. We should be listening and, and do it the way he likes it because it's for him after all. Um, I will argue by explaining, uh, by, by using the, the vehicle of, of Simchat Torah. The holiday of Simchat Torah uh, is not a biblical holiday. It's not mandated anywhere in the Torah that when you finish the annual cycle, the annual cycle of reading, by the way, was set in place by Moses. Moshe ordained that we should read the Torah on a weekly cycle um, and finish it once a year. But nowhere does it say that when thou shalt finish the annual cycle, if thou shalt make great celebration. Um, that's something we came up with. That was organic. Um, and there's a lot of value to that. Because, you know, we can obey and follow instructions all day long. But there's a fine line between, you know, obeying and caring. You know what I mean? And, and caring makes all the difference. And especially from the perspective of this criteria of it has to be done on the terms of the lowly realm, on, on, on the terms of the people. 
not 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 that we dictate what it should be. We're obviously we're we're making a home for God. It's not a home for us, but it's got to come from us. It's got to come from us, not just that we obeyed. Because again, when you just obey, imagine a Judaism without a Simchat Torah, right? So we follow the instructions. We obey what we're told. We trust our sages, and we read the Torah every week. And when we finish, we keep going. Yeah. There's so much is is missing from that 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 is added when you have a holiday like Simchat Torah. Like, what are we celebrating? Why? Why you don't have to celebrate this? Go to a Jew who's dancing with the Torah and Simchat Torah and say, "Why are you doing this? You don't have to. Are you crazy? Are you crazy?" Since when was that ever part of the calculus that I only do what I'm told and, and I'm just a robot? No. You're, you're missing the whole point. Come have a lechaim, have a piece of kugel, and you'll get the Torah next, next round and you're going to hold the Torah. And we're celebrating because we love it. Because we care. Because we're not just obeying. We're not just uh, checking things off the list. So that, that's the element that's missing. And that's why I think that Lori, Lori is correct that there's a small, we're, we're halfway there, you know? Yes, we're the ones who did it, but it was still commanded. We're still obeying. We haven't yet gotten a chance to prove to who? To prove to God, to prove to ourselves, to prove to the universe that we care, we get it. You know, we're not just following instructions. Mm. Something's still a little bit off, right? I think, Rabbi, that God likes it when our inspiration and love leads us to come up with our own ideas about doing things. Yeah, that's true. There is a caveat there we should mention. The caveat is that it can never violate anything that God told us. Yes, so of course. So you can't come up, you can't, you can't be inspired to say, you know, God, you have this great idea about Shabbos, but like, I'm going to do something better. Let's forget about Shabbos. I'm going to do Tuesday morning, two-hour mountaintop meditation. All right? What do you think about that, God? That's, that's, there's, you have to play in. But, years but ago, yes. Years ago, when my daughter was a little girl, Trina and I were sitting in the living room of our house, and my daughter came into the living room with a sandwich she had made for me, mustard and oh. peanut butter. <laughs> Daddy, I know you like mustard and I know you like peanut butter, so I made you yeah. a mustard peanut butter sandwich. She did that because she loved me. And she was trying now, to. The million taste dollar me. question. Right, right. It tasted terrible. Oh, so you ate it? I ate it, but oh. my daughter did it. My daughter did it because she loved me and she wanted to please me. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. I'm just happy to hear that you ate it. That was my next question. Isn't there something okay. also a little deeper that um, he, uh, we should know Hashem better and know him enough to be able to build the Mishkan or whatever, build something that he would love, not necessarily like it was your analogy. Right. Um, so that's, you, know right. Well, you know that she'll want flowers and this and that. And so then right. you... <laughs> right. Well, oh, that's exactly the idea of Simchat Torah. That's the idea of many customs that Jews developed over time in the context of observing a mitzvah. It's sort of that element. We we have we have room in our tradition. We have room for that element of you know what, knowing God. I think I like this. Again, that can never override direct commands. I can never override anything that's already established as halacha and law and, and all that whole system. Right. But there's definitely room for a Jew to say. On my own volition, I'm going to add, I think God will like this. It's the whole concept of what we call Hidur Mitzvah, beautifying a mitzvah. You know, when you would take a lul of an etrog, for example, right? So you can get a kosher etrog. That's not that expensive. It's, it's not that, it's, it's very affordable. Or you can get a beautiful etrog, right? There's sort of a spectrum of what constitutes a beautiful etrog and a whole, a whole list of things. We'll do a class before circus, right? But it's that idea. I'm, I'm going to beautify the mitzvah. I'm not just obeying. I'm going to beautify it. Light Shabbos candles. I can light, you could light very simple, two tea lights. You lit Shabbos candles. Beautiful. 
I want to get nice white tapers and then put them in silver candlesticks. Why? What? Silver candlesticks? It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah you must use silver candlesticks or, or crystal or whatever beautiful candlestick you use. doesn't matter. The whole idea of making it nice, you know? So, so, then, so there's room for that. So then the idea of the third temple, is that something that we're supposed to create on our own or is it going to be a replica of the other two? <clears throat> it's it's both it's both it's it's a whole it's a class for itself we have the design the design for the third temple was already in in the tanakh in the prophecy of uh Yechesko, of uh, ezekiel anyway we have a few minutes left i want to try to finish there's a lot to talk about but this is great i'm glad that everybody is really um understanding these these principles because this is really this is really how we view our lives and it helps cool. us understand our own, our own, our own history and our own personal story and our own personal ups and downs. And, and everything really is a process that's one step at a time, forward motion all the time. So let's let's quickly summarize. The temple does qualify the lowly realm um, criteria. It does create an environment where God's essence can be revealed. There are miracles in the temple all the time. That's by the way, one of the one of the flaws. Go back to the last slide for a second. One of the flaws of the temple is that while you were there, you had this constant feedback of an awareness of God. There was, there was a constant flow of miraculous events happening in the temple. The meat of the sacrifices did not get rotten. Um, there was this uh, fire that... All, all kinds of miracles. People bowed. There were thousands of people crammed into the space. They all had space to, to bow down to God. There was no, you know, it wasn't too cramped. You were in the presence of God, and that kind of takes away your ability to be bottoms up grassroots. It's a little bit of a catch-22. And so the temple is the lowly realm. It's a home for God's essence. It's not completely built by us. We're following God's instructions. There's this awareness of God in the temple all the time. It's not a pure grassroots project. And so again, what has to happen if we're not yet at the stage where we need to be and staying here will prevent us from moving forward to the next stage, the only thing that can happen is this has to be torn down, unfortunately, painfully. But in a very small way, it's not, cosmically, it's not painful. It's necessary, it's positive. It's allowing us to get to the next step. As, as, as crazy as it sounds to say that the day of the, the temple being destroyed by, by invading armies is a positive thing, but you, you have to say that. It's a positive thing because because of that destruction, we are now able, we're free to step into the next phase where our positive actions, our positive actions, one second, our positive actions, actions will be attributed fully to us, and now where comes now comes the greatest test of all. You're going into exile. You're going to be out of Israel. You're going to be a minority among other nations. You're not going to have your own place. You're not going to have the temple. You're not going to have that awareness of God. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to have very difficult times coming your way, Jews. How are you going to respond? And for the past 1950 years or so, We've been in a very, very low place, physically and spiritually. And we've endured a lot, every conceivable hardship. If you look at Jewish history, the last nearly two centuries, we, everything has been thrown at us. Every disaster, every decree, every pogrom, every campaign, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, bent on wiping the Jews out. And not just wiping the Jews out, but whoever survives should be so discouraged should be so disillusioned, have the spirit beaten out of them that they give up. They should just give up. But despite all of that, we Jews, the fact that we're here right now, look at us. It's 2021. Us and our ancestors have survived such unspeakable things. And we're gathered here today for a Torah class about the purpose of creation Mashiach, where we're going, our role in all of this. 
this class right now is, is, a, is a great success of, of Jewish history. We're, we're proving the point. We're, we're justifying everything right now. We're proving the point. We're achieving the purpose of creation right here, right now. This is it. Um, our exile is the perfect setting for the final stage of building a home for God. And, and more specifically, we can break it down into two different experiences that Jews have typically had throughout the years of exile. We've had moments and phases of persecution where our response has been, we're not allowed to create a home for God, but we do it anyway. So think about undercover Judaism in Soviet Russia, for example, right? A great risk to their lives and their safety. Jews kept learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, celebrating Judaism, and so on. That's one type of challenge during exile. We've had plenty of those. But there's another type of challenge that exile presents. And that, ironically, is the challenge of freedom. When you have the freedom to choose to do whatever you want, welcome to America. You can be whatever you want to be. You want to be Moshe Goldman? You can be Moshe Goldman. You want to be Max, uh, I don't know, pick a nice non-Jewish name. Gordon. You can be Max, Max, Max McDonald. You could be Max McDonald. Most people won't figure it out. You can do whatever you want. You can marry whoever you want. You can be whoever you want. You, you can work however you want. Freedom. No one's bothering you. In some ways, that's an even bigger challenge than persecution. Persecution at least has the advantage <laughs> advantage of you know it it pulls out that 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 you know that uh determination that that persistence it pulls out that stubborn spirit out of you oh you tell me no oh i'm gonna show you i'm right? gonna show you but with freedom with freedom you don't have that external force and so this is it's so ironic it's such a rich idea because when you're persecuted and oppressed for being Jewish and you're not allowed to practice Judaism, so there's that natural response of, oh yeah, I'll show you. But that itself is a weakness. It takes away from the grassroots. So why are you so inspired right now? Yeah, because yeah, someone yeah. else, That's someone else is oppressing you. you put some someone more else is oppressing you. Yeah, and uh, and that's what's causing you to, uh, to, to, to be so engaged. So where's your inspiration coming from? Outside of you. It's not fully you. It's not coming on your own terms. When you have a situation of freedom, prosperity, safety, and then you choose of your own volition. Look, look at this morning. Again, I'll use this class as an example. It's May 30th, 2021. I know we have lockdown and everything, but there's a variety of things you could have chosen to do with your time. Certainly, certainly when lockdown is over and you have real freedom again, you know, <laughs> maybe this is not the best day to make this point, but broadly speaking, in North America these days, you have the freedom to do whatever you want with your time. You choose to go to a Torah class. It's mind blowing. And there's no, there's no external factors driving it. God didn't come down on the mountain. We haven't seen God for a long time. Um, you're not being persecuted that, you're, you know, that inspires your Jewish chutzpah to show up to class. It's quiet. It's a quiet morning. And yet you show up to a Torah class. Mind-blowing thing. This is actually the apex of, of all three factors coming together. Take a look at um take a look at text um 14 we'll do 14 and 15 together um trina can you read number 14 please oh we're already we're, well yep no no no, no sweetheart. there we go all right hmm the yield of darkness, the future revelation and the messianic era that is the goal of creation is generated by our actions and divine service during these times of exile. For it is during our exile 
to a far greater extent than during the temple eras, that our power of self-sacrifice shines. This is because it is specific, specifically the spiritual darkness and divine concealment predominant during exile that mobilizes our potential for self-sacrifice. And you wanted me to do 15 as well? Yeah, so just a, just a quick note, this, this spiritual darkness that mobilizes our potential for self-sacrifice, our determination, that's, that, that, that can be reflected in both. So persecution will drive that, but freedom can also allow for that. It doesn't drive it as directly as persecution, which is why it's a little bit superior. But freedom also creates the environment where we can really um, express that. Okay, yeah, please go for 15. We're already over time. Applying the squeeze like an olive is cru crushed so that its oil can provide illumination. The crushing that we experience in exile causes the revelation of our soul's most essential light. However, there are two distinct degrees of crushing. We are crushed by external pressures, such as degrees, decrees against the performance of Torah and its both, that's A. Then B, we experience freedom and prosperity in both the material and the spiritual sense. And nevertheless, we are crushed and broken internally by the fact that we remain in a state of spiritual exile. Of the two possible experiences, our brokenness over the very fact that we are in exile produces the ultimate light. Thank you. So basically we're in a position now living in freedom. And I know that lightly the last couple of weeks we haven't felt that free, um, but God willing that will pass. We still live in a free society and we still have tremendous opportunity and, and, uh, and freedom. And if you think of the entirety of Jewish history, you know, we're, we're now at the tail end of things and all the external experiments have come and go. Like we've, we've passed through all those tests and experiments, like the data has been gathered, the reports have been filed, we know the score. The last thing that's left to see is what happens if you take it all away and the Jew can do whatever they want. This is the last experiment that, that really hasn't happened all that, all that frequently in our history, and certainly never to this degree. Um, and what's left for us is to say, you know what, I have it all. I have it all, but it's not enough. It's not enough because even as I, I have all these uh, freedoms and opportunities, I'm so bothered, I'm so broken by the fact that the world is not the way it should be. We are in exile. Godliness is not revealed. The ultimate uh, foundation for evil, which is the concealment of God, is still present. And that shakes me up. That bothers me. That the, the goodness that comes out of that crushing, that, that brokenness, is really the ultimate achievement that, that, uh, that God's waiting for. And I think he's seen it already. And as the Rebbe said many times, at this point, it doesn't make any sense that Mashiach has not arrived. It doesn't make any sense that the, the time that we're waiting for, the era that we're waiting for, hasn't already kicked in. And so all I want to end with is the, 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 the perspective that we have of history here, that we've seen how the ups and downs, the good times, the bad times, haven't exactly been just random ups and downs. They're all there with a purpose, with a design one stage leads into the other stage. And in order to get to the next stage, the previous stage, the previous moment has to be abandoned, has to be demolished, but it's all constructive and it's all progressive. And what's left for us now is to choose God, to, to look for God, to look for um, that truth that's been hiding without any external pressure, without any external motivation, just on our own terms. And one of the ways of expressing that is doing a mitzvah randomly. Doing a mitzvah, doing a good deed, just because. Because this is the vehicle for us to, 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 to reach the time of Mashiach, without any external pressure, without any external persecution, just because I'm a Jew and I want to contribute to making this world the way it's supposed to be. And... Um, Hopefully we can take this message to heart personally as well, but definitely a, a, a better understanding of our entire history and where we're going. Thank you all for joining.
Sorry, we went a little bit over time. Next week, we're going to be discussing what the Torah has to say about the human being referred to as Mashiach, um, that this arrow will be, will be ushered in by, through the agency of a human being, who will explore his personality and function, the criteria and so on, everything the Torah has to say about that. Um, you will come out with a handy dandy 30 second refutation for Christian missionaries who try to give you a hard time. And it should be lots of fun. Thank you all for joining. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Rabbi Goldman. Great course. You're very welcome.